is Daniel Biggs, who's going to free will a little bit and then address some questions uh, about her experience about teenagers reading and what turns them on. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm a, I feel like I have a bit of a bird's eye view. I'm a literary agent, so I know a little bit about the behind the scenes of what publishers are trying to do, knowing that in Australia in particular, young adult literature uh, by Australians has been falling somewhat in sales quite drastically. And unsurprisingly, when you just heard what the top three selling books were, it was still Harry Potter and then two American titles that have been pushed uh, via big adaptations or just big, huge pushes on social media. So unsurprising that Australians are really struggling and publishers know that. Uh, and I'm also someone who goes into schools because I am an, also an author who writes middle grade for eight to 12 year olds and young adult literature for the slightly older end of YA, probably 16 plus. And it's probably through that that I get the biggest fish eye godlike lens of what's happening with teenagers because whenever I go to schools, I inevitably walk through the library and I always ask questions. <laughs> I always have, have a look at displays. And then I always go to schools and I'm either, I'm either doing a writing workshop or the school is studying one of my books, so I'm talking about that, or I'm just going for a general book club because the librarian thinks that the students will be interested in my career because it's quite an interesting career. You don't meet many people that are literary agents and authors and, and now teach creative writing as well. And those are the opportunities where I really get to ask teenagers, what are you reading? What do you wish was available right now in terms of books that you don't have in your library? So in terms of freewheeling, uh, I guess the question of why wouldn't a teenager pick up a book that they've just found in their library is a really interesting one. Uh, and I find in certain libraries, for instance, librarians are trying to be very progressive and they often put out like LGBTQIA plus bookshelves and spaces. But what I find really interesting is librarians who say the kids won't look there. It's too out. It's too public for them. They'd much rather they be integrated into the stacks so that if they do pull out a book that is some queer literature, their friends don't know about it because maybe they're questioning. Maybe they don't want that kind of pressure of their friends seeing what book they're picking up. Uh, which I find really interesting because on the one hand I said to this librarian, I saw this really beautiful pride display. I was like, that's amazing. I hope the kids appreciate that. And she said, no. What they more get is one or two kids coming in during class time that they've kind of snuck in when they know no one else is going to be there and they say, can I just go and borrow that book quickly? Because they're, they're, they're still quite embarrassed about that. Uh, I also talk, when I talk to young kids as well, it's quite interesting because I wrote this book, The Year the Map Changed, intended for primary school readers aged 8 to 12. But I often find that it's being studied in high school in year seven, eight and nine, which to me, the book is perhaps too easy for those year levels. But teachers and librarians and things say to me, no, it's really great because you've, you've aimed it at curriculum, which I totally did. It's got themes of geography and refugees and Australian history in it quite deliberately. And they say some of the books for older teenagers that are their age are more commercial. They haven't thought as much about curriculum, whereas middle grade literature has thought about the teaching aspect. Because I guess we still have that almost didactic, but still trying to make it fun reading for kids. Whereas once they're teenagers, we kind of think it's got to be fun, fun, fun. But when teachers and, and librarians are looking for study, they're finding that middle grade is perhaps more aligned. And what I find interesting with that as well is when I go and speak to years seven, eight and nine kids, they say really funny things to me, like because I'm a literary agent and they think that I get to choose what books are published and things, they'll ask me things like, why do so many YA books feature 17 year olds? Why are they all 17? And I'm like, yeah, you're sitting in front of me and you're a 13 or 14 year old and you're wondering where are all the books featuring us? And they're more likely to be in middle grade. You know, middle grade being for eight to 12 year olds and knowing that kids read up, there are lots of middle grade books that have 13 and 14 year old protagonists that are still aimed at kids that are 10, 11, 12, but they know that they read up. So it's really interesting that younger teenagers in year seven, eight, nine will go and gravitate towards reading middle grade because I do find at the moment especially, a lot of young adult literature has gone and aged itself way up. So it's, it's, it's really quite, it's probably, it probably happened around the time of the Hunger Games when dystopian literature became really big and it was quite bleak and violent. We saw a spew of books that were quite old for older generations. 
And, you know, there were some 13-year-olds I met who said, I couldn't read The Hunger Games, it was too violent. I had to put it down as soon as one of the kids started, I didn't want to read it. And I thought, yeah, that's really interesting. We have this idea of YA as being for 17, 18, 19, that you walk into a school library and you're instantly reminded that, oh, wait, high school starts for, like, kids that are 12. Mm -hmm. Like, there's way more young kids that a school library has to cater towards. And that's when I go and look at the displays and it's things like manga is really big. There's still kids that are reading Diary of a Wimpy Kid and Anne Doe books because they're comfort reads or Harry Potter is probably a comfort read or more likely now it's one of those books that a parent handed down to them and said this was my favourite book and they maybe just captured them when they were young enough to be interested in that. Uh, so I find that really interesting that the publishing industry hasn't probably done a great job of catering for all ages. There's probably a huge gap between middle grade that's intended for lower end kids in primary school but lower end teenagers are reading it because there's nothing really in the middle for them. You know, once you're 15, it's like you have to leapfrog into being a 19-year-old kind of mindset because all those books kind of frog leap over into being about romance and defying your parents and violence and all that kind of stuff. And it was interesting to hear romance and dystopian leaps up. But you talk to some 13, 14, 15-year-olds and they have no interest in romance and they'll outright say to you, I don't want to book with a love triangle. No more love triangle. You know, those sorts of things because they're so sick of it because they're still 13 and they're, they're maybe still in that really awkward stage of, no, I just want to read adventure stories. The romance stuff can come later. And I totally remember when that happened for me when I was a teenager. I was reading BT, playing BT Bo by Ruth Park. There was like a tiniest little bit of romance in there that I decided to pick up and run with and say, I quite like that kissing part. That wasn't too bad. Very Princess Bride. Oh, the kissing parts weren't so bad. So I find that really interesting that... And the other thing is no kid picks up a book as though it's a theme park ride saying, am I the right height to read this book? Like, I'm 15, should I be reading something that's Hunger Games-esque? They're just picking up a book, like you said, based on the title, the cover, the blurb, what their friends have said about it. Uh, but we are probably missing a huge chunk in the middle because they feel like YA is too old for them. Middle grade does kind of suit them, but middle grade is still designed for primary school kids, but they're now in high school, so it's kind of a little bit of a hodgepodge. Uh, and the other thing that I do that annoys <laughs> parents and guardians and librarians and teachers, because I'll sometimes get invited by libraries to go along and do um, events with parents ab about this kind of topic. Uh, the annoying thing that I do is I say graphic novels are great because they are. And undoubtedly, parent, I can see in, in, the, in the crowd parents and teachers kind of going, well, please don't get on this. And I can see the kids being really excited, like, I told you so, Mum. So they did, yes. Graphic novels are wonderful. Uh, they have absolutely exploded in Australia and overseas. But what's really interesting is they've really only taken off in America, where we think of America as being the capital for comic books and graphic novels. It's really only since 2010 that America has started publishing graphic novels for teenagers and super specifically thinking of teenage girls. And what kicked it off was Raina Tieglemeyer's Smile, that graphic novel. That came out in 2010 and nobody thought it was going to do well. And if you've ever had the pleasure of hearing Raina Tieglemeyer talk about it, and I have when she was over in Melbourne many moons ago, she says she studied graphic novel uh, in, a, in like a PhD doctorate at her San Francisco University and even her lecturer said, teenage girls do not read graphic novels and comic books. They do not have an interest in it. It's a thing for teen boys only. Why are you doing this? It's a waste of time. Lo and behold, she didn't listen to them. Smile came out, sold in the gazillions, but publishers still thought maybe that was just a, a flub. We don't know if that's going to hold over. And it takes a long time to create graphic novels. <laughs> They're very laborious. So two to three years later, she came out with her book, uh, was it Guts or Sisters? One of those. Either way, her second book was also a mega hit. Huge. And that's when American publishers realised, oh, we need to start catering to this entire age. And now Raina Tieglemeyer is somebody, when she brings out a graphic novel, she gets in America alone a million copy print run because she will sell a million copies of her latest graphic novel within months that's how much she kicked it off. And I was in New York recently with the Australia Council and I was sitting in front of uh, publishers, children's book publishers in New York, and they were admitting 
we've only just started doing graphic novels. We're really behind in the times. And I was looking at Australia's publishing landscape and thinking, if you're behind, what are, what are we? And totally, Alice, Alice Oseman's Heartstopper has kicked that into higher gear even more, which is a really interesting one because it's a graphic novel that started life as a Tumblr account based on uh, characters from a book, a fiction novel that Alice Oseman wrote. And then the Tumblr account was just kind of an experiment that she did that did really well, it was racking up so many views that a publisher said, what if you made a book out of this? And now we've seen what that has wrought. Uh, and definitely Australian publishers are sitting up and taking notice of that. I can attest because I sold, as a literary agent, I sold the first graphic novel to Hachette Australia, uh, the first graphic novel that they are going to originate. And they are the same publisher that published Alice Oseman who's published by Hachette UK. So they're very much seeing the internal numbers of how well that has sold and thinking, oh, well, we need to get this. But the thing with graphic novels taking off is because they take so long to create, kids who love them, who go into a bookstore or a library and say, what's the next Alice Oseman? There's not a lot because publishing has been really, really slow. And in particular, there's if, uh, if a kid goes into a library and says, what's the Australian equivalent of Alice Oseman? There's kind of nothing yet because they're currently creating it and I can tell you the graphic novel that I sold is coming out in 2025 because it takes a long time to create them. They've got to write the manuscript, do all of the thumbnails, fill it out in full colour. It takes a long time to print. Uh, it's a whole task. So, you know, that's something that we're really thinking about. But graphic novels, I attest, are brilliant, particularly for the reluctant readers. Uh, and any parent or guardian that says, that's not real reading though, is it? I just say to them, how much of your day-to-day -day life is visual learning? Right? And how tricky is that to both marry up the words on the page with the images on the page and sometimes the characters are tricky and the words that they are saying belie what's happening in the image on the page and you have to do that kind of mind-bending reading to say, oh, hold on, the words and images are not matching up, there's some subtext going on here. It's really a higher form of reading and learning that's brilliant. Uh, and, and I would absolutely say, you know, if you, if you don't believe that graphic novels can be a high form of literature, just go and read Mouse by Art Spiegelman, uh, which should be studied everywhere. It's brilliant. So that's kind of my uh, kind of, I don't know, spiel, I guess. But I do have some slides. Maybe we can look at my slides later if you do want to know about just how insidious book talk is in affecting teen reading, which I'm always quite... Do we know it's teenagers that are reading Colleen Hoover? We have no real way of tracking. When somebody buys a book from a bookshop or Big W, we're not saying to them, how old are you? Can we just track? So, but I, I totally believe that the Colleen Hoover thing is something that we should probably touch on because uh, even as I've said, the largest cohort of kids within any school are generally the lower end. Like you were saying here, you've got teenagers that are studying at university, so you think about the older end of YA, but it's the reverse at a school library. They're thinking, hey, we've got kids as young as 12. How do we cater to them and make sure we've got enough books for them? And the stuff with Colleen Hoover and the likes of Sarah J Maas is really interesting because those are books that are for adults, but they're being pushed on platforms where kids are and there's no filter and there's no one saying to them, this probably isn't appropriate for you. And of course, the second that you say that to a kid, oh, is that appropriate? They're just going to want to read it more. So yeah, we can totally talk about that because I think it's really interesting. But that's my kind of grand spiel is, um, don't forget we have really younger readers in YA and it's not all 17 year olds. And some young readers are even questioning why all of the protagonists in YA are 17 and not 14. Uh, and that's definitely been changing since the Hunger Games era where dystopian came in, it became all quite violent and there was a big split between what some kids could read and what some couldn't. So middle grade has probably swept up quite a few of those teen readers. Uh, and I think graphic novels are great. And if you want me to talk about it as well, I can also discuss how kids probably are reading who are saying that they're reluctant readers, but they might just be reading fan fiction online not so much going to a physical bookstore or library and reading books, which we can also totally talk about because I used to write fan fiction and I turned out just fine. <laughs> so, thank you.